Oh, nah, with me, like a legend. Um, we already talked to Dank this morning, so I want to get this straight yeah. first. So I caught, I caught a piece of that. I caught a piece of that. Oh, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. So we have an icon. He's part of a legendary movement. He's part of a couple of duos, some of my favorites. Um, let me get a couple of them off. The Yancey Boys, the Joint Chiefs, and my most favorite, Ooh. Frank and Dank. Man, I got yes, the one sir. and only Frank Nitt on the, on the line. What up, dog? And how you doing, Ken? I'm chilling, man. You know, just, um, you know, trying to stay out the way with all this craziness going on in the world and, uh, you know, trying to stay busy, stay active. Yes, sir, man. Coming off the fresh up the release of Font of Tapes Volume 2. So you said you want to do a little bit of promo before we get into it. So let's talk about that fly mask you all got on going and I Hello, love let it. Let me show you. Let me show you. Yeah, that's that Jay Dillon mask right there. The greatest. Yeah, and I got a little Jay Dillon shirt on, too. Woo! Yeah, but, uh, yeah, man, you know, I, um, I uh, work with uh, his his family uh, with the Jay Dillon merch line and Delicious Vinyl. They have, they did a joint collab to do, you know, a line of Jay Dillon merch uh, gear. And, you know, I'm kind of the quality control guy and, you know, I kind of middleman the deal between my Dukes and the family and, and, and Delicious Vinyl. So, you know, we doing stuff all the time, you know, prior to. Corona, we was doing events and, and not just merch, but it was, you know, a little bit of everything. And we just recently dropped a, uh, an exclusive mixtape of, like, uh, exclusive remixes and productions that Dilla did with Delicious Vinyl. Ooh. And uh, you can get it online, deliciousvinyl.com. You go and purchase a piece of merch, you know, whether it's this or a shirt or a hat or a poster or whatever it is you want. And uh, put in the, uh, the promo code Dilla15 and you get the mixtape for free. All right, so, we'll, put, we'll put all that in the description for the good people watching, too. So all you have got to do is click the link. Yeah, man. Yeah, so, you know, just working, man, trying to, you know, do my part and keeping my man's legacy alive. And, you know, just being an artist, trying to be creative, you know? Man, what better person to do it with somebody who actually grew up with the man before all the music? Yeah, man. So I was wondering, too, how was growing up in Detroit, Frank? Because from how was school? Because, like, even I understand, like, you were a DJ, and he taught you how to DJ in seventh grade. But I want to know, like, before yeah. that, how was, like, junior high and elementary for y'all? Well, uh, I didn't meet them until junior high. Okay. Elementary. I moved in the neighborhood in 86. So that was, the like, my the year I went to junior high, right? Uh, so, uh, you know, prior to that, you know, Elementary school was elementary school, you know, uh, X and O, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, one, two, threes, and ABCs. Uh, but but I, I fell in love with hip hop around that time, you know what I'm saying, and started break dancing and that type of thing. So when I went to the neighborhood, when I went to Conan Gardens in '86, when I met Jay, when I met Dank, uh, like we bonded because we all loved hip hop and was dancers, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, you know. Middle school, high school was great, man. You know, DJing parties and just, we had a serious bond. And even though we lived in separate parts of the neighborhood, we all traveled to each other's neighborhoods and on each other's blocks and just, you know, we had a, a real bond and it was like a real, it's like the movie friendship, like, uh, yeah, I don't you know, Stand about. By Me or something like that. You Ooh, know what I'm saying? Yo, like, you know, Stand By Me, I love that movie. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was, you know, it's like, it's like that, man, you know, like, we really hung out and stayed at each other's cribs and all our parents knew each other. And it, you know what I'm saying? It yeah. Was, it was a whole other thing. But the flip side of that is that we had hip hop and then it was Detroit. So it was uh, shootings and drug dealings and all types of other things going on right outside the door. You know what I mean? So yeah. it, was, it was great, man. I, I wouldn't change it for nothing. Yeah, because they say it's all about certain times where you place yourself in and it's like an unwritten prophecy. And when you put yourself in those situations, that prophecy comes to life. Yeah, man. So, like, even coming off now, too, like, I understand, like, you guys are breakdancing. Dank was the last one to actually be a rapper, though. But when was your decision to be like, yo, I'm I'm, I'm being an artist? I don't know, man. Uh, you know, um, obviously, as a DJ, you hear music all the time. You're always shopping for the newest music or whatever the situation might be. And uh, it started off, you know what? I tell you when I said, okay, I'm going to rap. Okay. It was actually in high school. And it was uh, T3 and Batan from Slum Village in the lunchroom. And they said, you know what, Frank? Because, they, they, you know, we used to go to the lunchroom and 
me and Vatian would really do the, most of the beats on the table. We make beats on the table with our hands. You yes, know what sir. I'm and then Vatian and T3 would run freestyles and, and, and rap while we was at lunch. And uh, they they came back. It was because Vatian and T3 was a group uh, called H2O. And uh, oh, okay. they they uh and with, with, with Wajid as well. Uh, they um they came to school one day and was like, yo. Frank, man, we just did this new song, and they, they, they did the verses for the song, and, they, and T3 was like, yo, you should write a verse for that. And and uh, and, and, and Batim was like, yeah, man, you should write a verse. And, you know, I took it at that. I went home, and I wrote my verse, and I came back and dropped my little verse the next day. After that, I think, you know, I got stung by the bug, man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it, 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 something, something about it felt right. So from there, I just started, you know, working on my craft and, you know, doing, like, for us, we didn't have, you know, uh, Instagram and things like oh, that. Oh, yeah, there was no internet back then. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, it was none of that. So, you know, you had to be creative in how you did things. So, uh, later on, as I was growing into my craft, uh, I was working street promotions. I was doing hip-hop street promotions. Like, I worked, like, uh, Biggie's record and just a bunch of hip-hop, right, for the, for the big uh, street promoter in the city. He worked with all the major labels and artists or whatever. So, uh I would get instrumentals and things of that ahead of time, right? So uh, I would take instrumentals of popular songs, Busta Rhymes songs, Biggie songs, and take their lyrics and twist them and, and put them on my voicemail. So when you called my house and got my voicemail, you would give me rapping a verse to that beat, but about you calling my house and leaving a message. Yeah. Everybody called my house. He would call me first and say, Frank, don't answer the phone. And he would call on a three-way with three other people on the phone and let them hear my voicemail. And he did the same thing for Dilla Beats. And that's just kind of how it built up. Damn. And this was before we ever thought about being Frank and Dank or any of that. You know what I mean? And those were all those like, little recording tapes, too. Like, you had to actually put in the machine, I'm guessing. Like, those yeah, kind of, yeah. Yeah, you had to, had to press the record on your machine with the beat playing in the background and rap over it. was, you know, but, you know... I, it was the fever, man. You had to get it out somehow. Yeah. At times, the technology is just crazy now. You can do, like, almost anything of technology, like, when it comes to communication and recording. Like, like right now. Yeah, man. You can almost record an album on your phone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, yeah. Can, you can make beats. You can, you, can, you know what I'm saying? You could probably get sequence of software if you got a good enough phone. Well, well, since we're on the topic of, you know, technology and stuff like that, um... You know, one of the persons that you guys came up with, Mad Lib, he actually made Freddie Gibbs' uh, Bandana album on the iPad. That's yeah, crazy. Yeah, that's what I heard. So, so like, when you're, like, coming off now, too, I remember the very first time I ever heard of a Frank and Dave. It was Junior High Dance. Whew, man, take me back to that. <laughs> I was still virgin at the time. I was still virgin at the time, but, man, you know, I was still high no shorty. And then McNasty Filth came on. And when I heard that, uh, I was already aware of Jay Dilla. But when I heard you guys, I was like, oh, I need everything by Frank and Dave. I need everything. Right. And, and that's where it started. That. I appreciate that. So, like, um, you know, I want to talk about before that. So, like, I understand now, too, like, when you guys were handing out uh, recording in Dilla's studio, too, weed and magazines mm -hmm. weren't essential. So, I got to ask, what kind of magazines was Frank reading at the time? Uh, it was most, it was either a car magazine, because I'm, I'm heavily into cars. Okay. Or, or, yeah, that's another side of me nobody knows about. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and, uh. It, it was hip hop magazines, The Source, Double XL, Word Up, you know, just Word Up, just those different things, just seeing what was going on in the industry. Okay. In Detroit, so you know, the action wasn't the industry action wasn't there like that. Yeah, yeah, because like it wasn't like as viewed as it is today now too. But back then, no, the landscape was whew, it was way different as as it is today now too. But the thing I like about what yeah. your guys' career now too is like you guys. Stay in your lane, but you're not afraid to step out of your lane now, too. Like the jewels in my backpack, like that's what hell of a uh, EP by you and Terrence Martin. Yeah, man, you know that that was a blessing. It was actually Terrence that reached out to to me. You know what I'm saying? He got in touch with me. It was just like kind of like, yo, bro, I, I really messed with Dilla, obviously, and then I love Frank and Dank, man. If you ever get out here, and I was in Detroit at the time, if you ever get to LA, I'll have me we'll record something, and I happen to come out there maybe two weeks later and man we got in the song we, we got in the studio and we did nine songs in three days Ooh, yeah. See, oh, that, that's quick that's quick yeah but you know he had bangers on deck he just kept pulling up bangers he just kept pulling them up but he also 
also made the joint with corrupt from scratch right there on the spot. You know what I mean? So did you, you kind of did you kind of find it like Martin. did you kind of find it like full circle on how like Slum worked with uh, corrupt on Fantastic Volume Two, and then you and Terrence Martin had that song of corrupt. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think I think it all works together because I think Corrupt, knowing the Dilla connection and, and being down with Slum and, and then having his people, being terrorists, come and say, yo, nah, I want you to get on this joint. And then, you know, on top of that, he played music for him before he said, okay, I'm going to get on the joint. And when he heard the, the, the rhyme, he's like, okay, cool, I'm, I'm in. Get with a verse at, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, even at the beginning of, the, of that record, he says, Welcome. We're like, where you been at? This M- this MC type of stuff. You know what I'm saying? This ain't like about no gang or no none of that. This is just about MCs and welcome, bro. Like that was him welcoming me into the MC realm. You get what I'm saying? So you know, it, it it's a it's a blessing, bro. It's a blessing. That's the best I can say. You know what I mean? Hey, he's considered one of the best now too. Like when you guys are like recording, like uh, because when I talked to Dank, he said like. A recording session with you guys was like an event. Like you wanted to be there, and it really showed yeah. throughout. And it really showed throughout the music now too. Now, is it true that Pause was recorded after a night at the strip club? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, our routine, our routine recording with Dylan. Um, I don't know if you get the ghetto bird going by, but anyway, uh, we can hear a little bit. Uh, uh, our routine with Dylan was that we would go to the studio. I mean, we would go to like we'll get up early run around, car wash, mall, food, that type of stuff, whatever business needed to be handled, you know, that, this, that, the third. And then he would mess with some beats a little, like maybe find some samples or just listen to some stuff and see what he want to do, right? And then it's time to go get the mojo for that. Uh, so it, he go and, you know, then the mojo is to go to the strip club and to, you know, uh, see... The, the women, the curves on the woman, <laughs> women got a certain bounce. And that bounce translates to music. Ooh. I know people going to think we just want to look at some naked ass. <laughs> and there's nothing wrong with naked ass. No, nothing wrong at all. Is, uh, it wasn't that. It was more about um, it just had a certain move and a certain vibe to it that, you know, most dudes that in that situation don't make like boom bap hip hop. You yeah. know what I'm saying? So us taking that vibe, taking that bounce, and then going and making boom back was our mojo. You get what I'm saying? So we would do that. And then when we got back to the studio, Dilla would make a beat or put up a beat that he already had. Right? And he made me learn how to run all the equipment. So okay. he wouldn't have to sit and record our vocals. Because, you know, early on, We'd be messing up and this, that, and the other. And he had to sit there and be the engineer after making the beat, and he still got to mix it. So he eventually he said, "You know what? I'm not doing this no more. Frank, you need to learn how to record, y'all." So I got a pen in the pad and figured it all out. So after that, like at four, at two, three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning, when he got the beat up, we smoke a couple. Boom, he going upstairs to lay down to the morning. Me and Dank would then record our vocals. I would get all the vocals down sequenced out, you know, our hooks and all that in place. And then in the morning, he would wake us up with a blunt and mix the record. And then that's what we listened to for the rest of the day. That was our routine. Before we were putting records out. This is before we were putting anything out for the public. So when pause came around, when just actually making records for sale came around, the routine was the same. So pause was literally, it took him 15 minutes to whip that beat up. Whew. All right, I'm going upstairs. And he went upstairs, and it took us about two hours, maybe, two and a half hours to lay the song from start to finish. You know what I'm saying? And we laid it on down, went to sleep, because he had a the situation set up where his house had three levels. It had a basement, a regular floor, and an upper floor. Okay. And he put sleeping arrangements on each floor. So oh. we could come there, work, and then everybody had a place to go sleep. Oh wow! Right? So yeah, yeah, that like when he when he got that crib because that was when we first moved out the hood. When he got that crib, that was the plan. We about to get this Frank and Dank thing together. They're gonna have to be here. We call it boot camp. They're gonna have to be here. Y'all can't. Ain't. I mean, you can go home every now and then. Yeah. 
nah, we're going to be here three, four, five, six, seven days at a time. And we're going we gonna to work on this music. So he set it up that way that we could all sleep there comfortably, have space, you know, for ourselves when it's sleep time, and then hit the basement and work. That's it. And so, you know, he woke us up, mixed that joint, and that's pause. That's how, I, you know, and us making it had no idea it would turn into what it's turned into. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, you can't. And like. You can't. We can't. We can't do a Frank and Dank show without doing that record. Like, people would. Oh, you know yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they'd be mad at us, bro. Like, they'd be ready to fight. So, you know. But, like, even just, like, hearing that, too, like, you guys had, like, that organic friendship, and that's why the music came out the way it did, because you guys were friends before it all. Yeah, yeah, before any of that. Before any any of the... And, that, and that's the, rare. The, like, you guys didn't let money get part. involved, ego, nothing. Like, you know how... That's that's super rare these days. You know, yeah, and I think it, beco- it comes from that, because, you know, a lot of time, you know, dudes come together when they already been separately in the struggle you understand and then they come in with their own kind of ideas and we got to make this group thing work well we all came together so young that we went through the struggle together you know what i'm saying yeah uh you know everything first kids uh uh you know what i'm saying first police interactions all (laughs) all these (laughs) things that 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 happened to a young man from detroit coming up in the hood we went through together yeah you know what i'm saying so our bond is different. Our bond is just different. You know, yeah, I've known Dank 30 plus years. You get what I'm saying? Like, yeah, that's my guy. My bond is different. And like, and like, even like you guys, even like going on your first two and now two, when Slum Village was open up for a tribe called Quest. Can you like, what's your most favorite memory from that tour? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um I, I don't know if I can tell you my favorite memory. Okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah. Because it might, might be a little risky, might be a little risky. Uh, but no, I think you know what? Um, beyond seeing my guys slum, that was like a big moment in the process of watching your people take strides to making it. You understand? Oh, yeah. And for us, because we was a unit, a group, you know, the better they do, the better we do. You get what I'm saying? So. There was that aspect, but then just kind of being out on the road and, and and being able to be around like you know a legendary group like Tribe. Yeah. Uh, they they embraced us, right? And for me, my eyes was on like what was going on behind the scenes in the business and how things ran and 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 just how the money was made and all these different things. And that was my first real experience with tour money and. and and being able to be, ex- someone explained to me, shout out to Lytro, he was their role manager. Okay. Lytro put me on game, you know what I'm saying? Uh, he put me on game then and just kind of explained to me how things broke down and how these people worked here and we did it this way and that. And then later on, like the Roots, you know what I'm saying? Ooh. Quest Love gave me game, touring game about the way they broke it down. You know what I'm saying? Like So that tour was the beginning of that for me. You know what I'm saying? And it's such a big, pivotal part of what I do now. I mean, well, Corona is kind of uh, uh, pissed on that fire. But yeah. uh, but once that fire is back lit, it's, it's a big part of what we do, touring and, and moving around the world, doing shows and this and that. Um, and, you know, because of that, I, it's become part of what I do on a regular business basis. You know what I'm saying? Booking tours, uh, uh, booking acts. You know what I'm saying? Uh, putting together group tours and things of that nature. And, and basically getting packages together to sell to venues and or agents. You know what I'm saying? Like doing the extra leg work that most artists don't do. They kind of got an agent and a booking company and a bunch of people take a whole bunch of money. Well, no, I'll skip all that. I'll deal with my guys, get the stuff together, and then we'll go and we'll break as much bread as we possibly can. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, yeah, I think that part of the tour was uh, monumental. And then, you know, just, I'm saying, we was on tour with Tribe Called Quest. And it was shows with Wyclef John and, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Just, you know, crazy stuff. You know, I ain't never been to Georgetown, but I was on the campus and I met uh, uh, Coach Thompson. And, you know what I'm saying? Like, wow. okay. all these different things. So, that tour was crazy. 
Yeah, just even a name. Wow, and like the experience now, like, cause like even like learning like gems like that on the road now too. Like you don't really get like most people, but like you're with the party and stuff like that. But you wanted to actually like learn. Like you know, if I'm getting into this, I gotta know. So that's very good. That's yeah, very yeah, rare. yeah. That's that's always been my mo, bro. Like you know, I like to know how things work. Oh yeah. And not and not and not everything. Just just you know the things that I'm interested in. <laughs> sure. Um, uh, you know, I'm like I'm not like the nosy guy who gonna be. Trying to figure out what you got going. Like, yeah, I know how to concede and say, "Yo, yo, you got that going on. You handle that. If I ever need that, I'll call you." You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But, you know, if it's something that I'm gonna be doing or be involved in, then yeah, man, I want to know how it works. Now I have to ask now too because everybody knew Jay Dilla loved donuts. Now has he ever like just like handed you guys like donuts and you guys got hooked on it? Like, yo, know like this looks pretty good. Nah, no, nah, I mean, you know what? Donuts, I mean, obviously because of the the, 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 the the sentimental value of donuts because of the album and all the different things, but he was just a snacker, bro. <laughs> he was a he was a he was a real snacker, man. Like he like his mother makes the most my deuce makes the most incredible uh uh sweet potato pies oh, you can oh, ever imagine. God. And she makes she makes like ten of them at a time. I don't know how she does it, but she does it. And like he just he loves snacks, man. It's always been a big snack guy. So even like when the money was real big and everything was real good, like my dudes would go shopping for him and come and you come to the house and it's like literally like a diner, a snack <laughs> diner in his kitchen. It's cakes all around Damn. and MMs and candies and all types. So he was a serious snack guy and donuts was really a big part of that. Oh, wow, are right? you just making me hungry? You were thinking about something like that, that you guys got the snack on. <laughs> so, so like even like um, you guys did like incredible sessions now too. But I read somewhere that you guys were in a session with Della, D12, and Dre. Is that true? No, no, no. We wasn't there. Okay. But Dilla went to that session. Oh, he! Oh, wow. He went to that session. Like, uh, there was a. They were working on a D12 album, and uh, Proof, which is the homie, you know what I'm saying? R.I.P. Proof. Yeah, I mean, yeah, R.I.P. Proof, and shout out to, you know, everybody in D12, him and everybody. Uh, but Proof was the, the homie homie, right? Like, so, uh, Proof had told him to come over there. I guess they had some things they needed to discuss. I don't know, with music, whatever. And uh, Dre was there supposed to be in town working on the D12 album, right? And uh, after that session, after he went there, and like, you know, Dre had his, his workout uh, situation as far as his NPCs and his live musicians and his thing, you know, to create his thing. And after that session, he came to a 48-hour session. Oh, wow. Night, 48 hours. Oh, my God. Because we were in the studio on the other side of town. And he came to that session, and it was that session that he decided that he there was never gonna be no more samples on Forty Eight Hours. Oh, so oh, so wow. He said, "Okay, I'm not doing that. So I'm about to change everything. I'm about to take because we had laid about seven songs. Yeah, a Forty Eight Hours. And he was like, "I'm about to take all those and change the vocals to everything." Oh. Y'all just finished with the beach, y'all pool, but I'm changing everything. My Dukes, I had to beg him, beg him. We argued for him to keep that beat. So he said, okay, I'll keep it, but I'm playing everything over. So we had to rent a mandolin <laughs> and <laughs> we had to do some stuff to get that right. Jeez. And like even even like hearing like sessions like that, like I wouldn't like like can you imagine like Jay Dilla and Dre like producing a track together? Like that that gee, oh my god, I still think about that. Yeah, I, you know. It's uh it's a lot of things that, that were very close that probably should have happened but they didn't. I mean we was there when he met Jay Z as well. You know? Yes, sir. Jay Z Dilla track should have happened, but it didn't. I heard that you guys went clubbing with Memphis Bleak and Beating Siegel one time. You say, what's that? I heard you guys went clubbing with Memphis Bleak and Beating Siegel one time. Nah. we. Uh, you know what? We went clubbing with The Rock. Okay. We met, we met Memphis 
that time, at that time. We met Memphis before we actually went to the club. Because what happened was, <laughs> Jay-Z's, I mean, Jay-Z's cousin managed Dilla for an amount of time. Uh, his cousin, Beehive. Yes, sir. And when we were doing the 48 Hours deal, uh, finishing up the record, actually, we were coming to New York to do the photo shoot for 48 Hours. Okay. Uh, uh, Beehive, Jay-Z's cousin, was uh, Dilla's manager at the time, the, the management company he had. I think it was Between Friends or something, or something like that, Between Friends Management, I think it was. But uh, So, while we were in New York on our photo shoot, Dilla came the day after, right? And in that time, we was all kind of running around, doing stuff, taking pictures, all the different things. Because we shot in Manhattan, we shot in Brooklyn. And then, at some point, he was like, okay, we're going to go over here to the studio. So, Jake and me, Jake, basically. Right, and, and we went to the uh, went to the studio. Uh, I want to say it was in Brooklyn, but it might have been Manhattan. It might have been Manhattan. I'm not sure, but we went to the studio, and like they had the front area, and it was all like the the Rockefeller guys, all the you know, uh, the crew guys, Ty Ty and his crew, right? And then I think Jay and Pharrell was in the back room. So oh, wow, Jay Jay and Pharrell was back there, right? And uh, oh shit, getting attacked by bees out here. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, we don't want that. We don't want that. Yeah, I can't get stung in the face. Not while we on live. Anyway. Oh, no, we don't live. We don't live. It's pre recorded. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. So, yeah, so, uh, so what was that? Jay and, um, Jay, Jay and Pharrell was in the back, right? So, after that meeting, uh, we went to, um, the, the Rockefeller crew. Decided to take us out. So, Ty Ty and a few of the guys, and a whole bunch of guys actually, we went to this bar and it was like, it was crazy because everybody was like, yo, uh, uh, everybody, like the Rockefeller dudes was like fighting on who was going to put up their they black card, their company car. Right? <laughs> everybody had cards, right? Everybody had like, you know, the expense. Yes, yeah. right. So, so everybody, like, I'm gonna put my card. I'm gonna put my card up. And then one dude came on the back and said, "Y'all too late. My card already up." Right. <laughs> so they like, "Yo, y'all boys order whatever y'all want, Crystal, uh, whatever, whatever y'all want. Just order it up, right?" And and right before we went on that excursion, we met Bleak. And Bleak was, I think, going to the studio his, his damn self, right? So yeah, that's more around around the story there. Wow. See, that's like priceless memories that only people like like. Wow, like <laughs> just to be able to be a part of that now too, and like one of the, one of the most projects that I love by you now too, like this project when I first heard it, I was like it was two thousand and eleven. I think you know what I'm going with this, uh, the medicine so channel eighty five. Yeah. Oh my god, that's, yeah. that, oh, that's my shit right there. I love it. So can you take me back to the can you take me back to the recording of that iconic album? Oh man, crazy story with that. I got a bunch of crazy stories, crazy. Uh, so, Madlib, shout out to Madlib. Shout out to Madlib. That's my guy, man. Madlib is, you know, he's, he's crazy with it, right? Like, so, Madlib hit me up. You know, obviously, we knew each other after J-Lib and all these different things. Hit me up. Frank, doing this, you know, uh, every month, an album, a project album, whether it be the album or whatever, right? And uh, he had already did, no, he didn't do the, he hadn't done the guilty thing yet, I don't think. Okay. Was right before the guilty or maybe he did it. I don't, I'm not sure. But anyway, he hit me up, and he was like, yo, I want to get you to do this record. Right? And I'm like, what? Ah. Thumbs up. Let's do it. Right? <laughs> Hell yeah. So, right? Like, no it, we ain't t no talk about money or any of that. Just, this is something I'm just going to do. Yeah. Right? And, and that's my guy. And he, he always treated me with the same thing. You know what I'm saying? If he's going to do it, he's just going to do it. You know what I mean? So, uh, so, the first three joints that we recorded, we were in the studio together, and we actually did it in one day. No, it was two days, and we did four joints in two days, right? And everybody was bugging out because Mad Lib was actually there because he's notorious for, you know, sending the beats, and he ain't going to be in the studio. <laughs> yeah. it'll, it'll, you know what I'm saying? Like, he ain't coming to hang out in the studio with you. But for those two days, Mad Lib was in the studio. He, came, he actually came and picked me up. We went to the studio and we laid these four joints, right? So after that, 
it was like, okay, we're going to book some more studio time and, and we're going to get some more records done. Okay, bet. So then, you know, a couple days go by, he called me, your friend. Yo, okay, uh, I got these beats for you. I'm going to get you some beats because he's supposed to give me some beats. And if anybody's ever heard, like Mad Lib will literally give you 300 beats. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and this was back, this was back with CDs. So he'd give you three CDs with a hundred beats on them. Damn. Right? And, uh, so, you, uh, he, he tell me, Frank, come, come by my studio, at his, at his personal studio, and I'm, uh, I'm gonna give you these beats. Right? And so you can write and finish the album. I said, okay, bet. So he called me. I'm at the studio. Get in the car. I drive over there. I get to the studio. He's there. Live, what up? Now, man, you live is is like not somebody you can pin down. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. You got <laughs> to catch him. You can't predict him being anywhere. You just got to catch him, right? So, oh, Liv, what up, now? What's going on? He said, oh, okay, yeah, man. Uh, okay, I got, uh, we're going to do this record. He go, he gave me a big old handful of money, right? He got some money. He gave me a big old bag of weed. He got some weed. <laughs> but I forgot the beats. <laughs> I left the beats at the house. I said, oh, okay, okay. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to be back over here the day after tomorrow, and then I'll have the beats, and you can get the beats. Okay, bet. But for now, take your money, take your beats. <laughs> right? I go, a few days go by, you call me. Okay, yeah, I'll be at the studio at this time. I get over to the studio. Yeah, man. Uh, here goes some money. Here goes some weed. <laughs> I forgot the beats. Damn it. Okay. <laughs> I leave. When I come back, it's like 420. And the date is 420, right? Oh, okay. You know, in Cali, on 420, it's, it's smoke out in this joke, right? Oh, I bet. So, so, so I come back on the third day. And it's 420. And I'm like, yo, okay. I'm ready to go. Okay. Here goes some money. <laughs> Here goes a big-ass bag of weed and paraphernalia and a gigantic bag. <laughs> but I forgot the beats. Oh, man. I said, okay, man. How about I record vocals to my own beats and give them to you, the vocals, and then you just build to those. And he looked at me and he was like, you can do that? I said, yeah. <laughs> do it. And that's how that album got finished. Wow. So and you put in like the rhymes and oh, wow. Yeah. And then he just went and built around all that shit. Yeah. He, he is a genius for that. Wow. But like, even like, like, even like, to hear like that coming to fruition now too, like that must be like somewhat plays out in your head. It's like, wow, that actually, that album came out amazing. Oh no, that album is incredible to me. I love that record. <laughs> now, is there any beats that you that like that he actually gave you like in the first four that that you heard and they passed on? Like, like you know how they said like how Freddie Gibbs had um no parties in L.A. first before Kanye. Like, did you ever have like a Madeline beat that you passed on and it wound up to being on somebody else's record? Um, no, I mean, well, yes, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure, because I, I, you know, I had Mad Lib beat tapes where I had 500 beats, <laughs> yeah, 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 and, and I, I got one off of there, right, but never one that he sent me directly, and I said, eh, nah, that's okay, and then somebody else got on, no, nah, if he sent me something, I'm gonna get on it. Okay, yeah. So, so like, even, like, hearing, like, like you guys' relationship now, too, like, because, like, it's what you said. You can't pin them down. So, like, even, like, those times would yeah. be, like, you, you cherish those moments, I bet. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Now, I was wondering. You know, that's not, um, <laughs> it's not a, it's not easy with that guy. Johnny, you know, <laughs> that guy, that guy is on another, in another place. But, you know, I, I, Dilla was the same way. Mm. You yes, know, sir. You had to really be in his circle to be able to pin him down somewhere. Have you ever met MF Doom? Yeah, a couple times. Wow. Okay. Wow. Yeah, Doom super cool. Yeah, he, he's also notorious for not being able to track down or pin down like that. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I can see that. <laughs> but that's Doom, though. You know, Doom be sending Doom bots. You know, he, that's what it, Doom is like. Man, I, oh no! I tell you a crazy, a crazy funny story with Doom. It cracked me up. So we, we was backstage at this show. I don't remember what the show was, but Mad Lib was DJing at the time, and it was a bunch of celebrities there. Like Common was there, and damn, just a bunch of people. But Mad Lib was DJing, and we was like at the backstage on the side of the stage, right by his booth, and. 
MF Doom was sitting there, and he had some tall, like, light-skinned dude with him, right? You know, MF Doom's a shorter, dark-skinned guy. And, uh, uh, you know, we all just standing there chilling, laughing, kicking it. And, and Mad Lib had something planned. He had walked off on the stage on the, by us on the side. And uh, it was like, y'all want to see something funny? And so MF Doom gave this dude a mask. Gave him, <laughs> gave him the mask, right? And the dude, now the dude is like 6'3 and light-skinned. <laughs> I just mistake him for MF Doom. And, walk, and he walked out on the stage and the people lost their oh, mind. Now, we all died in the back. And eventually they realized it's not him. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but I'm saying, I'm saying, it, like he is so, he is such like a, 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 a like a presence yeah. that you can send something that you just know, your, your, you can see that this is not him. Yeah. <laughs> they love him so much they still gonna cheer it's all <laughs> you know <what> and like <laughs> and like what I love about you you're a part of a lot of groups now like because you're not just known for Frank and Dink you're known for like being a part of like the Joint Chiefs the Yancey Boys so what made you like want to do link up with Ella and actually continue like Yancey Boys with the quicksand and the Sunset Boulevard oh man that you know um it was family, man. Oh you yeah. Know what I'm saying? So so it's like it's easy to work with family. Oh yeah. And, uh, you guys got that bond like you were saying. And also, you know, especially with the Sunset Boulevard record, you know when we initially started that, it was really for Illa. It was Illa's idea to be a group. The first record we did for that was Throwaway. Oh right? wow. And if you go back and look at the original when we put Throwaway out as a single it said Yancey Boys featuring Frank Nick. Ah. Because I wasn't meant to be in the group. The Yancey Boys was Dilla and Illa. And after we did the throwaway, it was Illa like, nah, Frank, it should be me and you in the group. And it should just be the Yancey Boys. And, you know, who am I to tell? My bro, now, nah, let's do it, okay. Man. And so we went at it. And, you know, for that particular record, because it was intertwined with family business, my dukes and this and that. I was an executive producer on it. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I wow. really dealt with the beats and all the artists Common and and Talib and, 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 and Slim Kid 3 and, and yeah, all the guys, all the guys, right? So, uh, guys and girls, guys and girls. Oh. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> guys and the girls. Uh, so yeah, no, I, I, I played more of an executive role on that record as well. So, you know, that played a part in that. And then, you know, me and Illa had been touring together before that record anyway. Yeah. Since around 2009, you know what I'm saying? 2010, we had been out touring as Illa J and Frank Nick separate anyway. So, you know, it's family, man. It, with things like that, you just kind of go. Yeah, because you guys got classic records on there like Goax DJ, Jeep Volume, Del Reno, oh. Fisherman, Matt, I go on Slip In Without Wins. Yeah, that's it. I love that album. Yeah, man. I, you know, I, 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 I'm very proud of that record. I'm very proud of, uh, of Dilla, and obviously Dilla's always going to shine and be a star when it comes to that. But, you know, and, and very proud of the way the people in, you know, our little community kind of reached out and helped us and, and supported us on that record. So, now nah, that's a great, great record. I really appreciate that record, whether I was on it or not. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. Now, was that your yeah. first executive produced album? Um, in that capacity, with Delicious Vinyl being the label, and yes. Oh, wow. You know, I had done projects of my own already, right? And, and, you know, I mean, the Frank and Dank projects and that, you know what I'm saying, like, I always was involved in those parts behind the scenes and all the, because again, things that I'm doing, I want to know all the aspects. So I was always that guy, but in an official capacity with basically somebody else's money, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. that, that could be considered the first, you know what I'm saying? But, you know, uh, I put out a, a, a book and album together, you know what I'm saying? Like, so, and I, I, did, I did all the production and co-wrote the book and put it out through my own label and you know what I'm saying so I guess that's considered the executive side as well but again for somebody with somebody else's money yeah that was the first <laughs> wow that's not a, that's a good job for your first attack huh? 
I appreciate it. <laughs> hey, anytime. Yeah, I got to keep it all the way back. So, like, um, I also have to ask, um, because in one of your recent interviews, I, I don't think it was recent. Um, YouTube never actually gets the date, right? Um, would you yeah. still do a record of Shania Twain? Um, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Like I still, I still love that record. I still that it's it's only the one. It's not like I'm a Shania Twain, a diehard Shania Twain fan, and not, you know, uh, but that that particular record, I love that record. Yeah, because we I all have like record. those certain records, like be like from a different artist, like we never expect. Like yo, I like that. Record. It's like really, like yeah, like yo, Phil Collins in yeah, the night. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I got a, I got a bunch of records like that. that just you know, you know, I, you know, I I love music. Yeah. I'm diehard hip hop. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Uh, but I love music overall. Yeah. And so I can appreciate all rock music and all jazz, R and B. Now, now, am I a? Uh, you know, is there a rock group that I'm a diehard fan of where I know like multiple songs, multiple albums? No. <laughs> you know, I keep it 100, but. Do I know some crazy rock records that you probably wouldn't think that Frank would like? Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, it's true. It's true. Because I'll quote you. Like, I'll tell you, like, like Twisted Sister. And this is one of our joints that we're not going to take. That's oh, yeah, I don't know that, Georgia. You know what I'm saying? Like, like that type. Like, like, you know what I know about that. You know what I'm saying? You know. And I, I would listen to, like, the Rand Rand and, you know. But anyway. <laughs> I just have to ask because then I was like one of the most grabs just like watching it like just out there I was like y'all do record of Schneider I'm like I'm gonna ask him that if he still wants to do that <laughs> yeah no man you know I, uh, I'm a music guy man so okay you know I, I, I listen to a little bit of everything and Shania Twain the, again that record I fell in love with that record and if I could get her in the right space type of situation right Hip hop space got to have enough boom back to it. Oh, she would kill it. Oh, yeah. You you get what I'm saying? Maybe we find a really dope uh, country western guitar and put some boom back behind it and let her sing. Hell yeah. Yeah, she definitely. (laughs) And you know, it's just for the experience. It's not even about, you know what I'm saying? I don't, because I've never had a real like hit record. So I don't have that expectation on me. Well, like, well, I, you, well, you may I never had a. Music. Well, you never may uh, never had a hit record, but you got timeless records. Well, yeah, yeah, but I think that comes from just the love of good music, as opposed to trying to chase the hit. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I, 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 I love how you worded that. And you know, and for me, I, I feel like, uh, you know, I've never had. It's like a drug, a, a drug addict. You know what I'm saying? I've never used crack. Yeah. So I can't really explain what a crack fiend feels like looking for that high. You get what I'm saying? Yes. Never had a Billboard number one platinum hit and all that. So I don't know what that feels like. So I have no desire to. I don't really care. Damn. Man. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's like a good and analogy to I, put it like that. And I think I've, I've been at it so long that even if it happened today, it'll be great. But whatever. Yeah. Like your legacy's you know already saying? cemented. Yeah, yeah. It, it is what it is. Like, the, the money would be great. I could buy my mama that house I always wanted to. You know what I'm saying? That's yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, is it see and like um is it true that you met Janet Jackson? Yes. Yes, very true. Wow. Like that's like very that's true. that that's beyond legendary right there. Very true, yeah. Yeah. I told the story. I did this uh 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 it's like uh this thing on live on, on live. I called it a story in a song and basically what I did was told like my personal stories like the personal dealer stories but connected to particular songs because it's situations that i've been in or been a part of that songs came out of these situations you yeah. know what i'm saying or the situation was about the song and uh i told that story about uh meeting janet yeah, yeah i met janet Thank, thanks to q-tip oh Sound wow Q-tip. oh wow and uh yeah, yeah i met janet we, we we were actually like um Two seconds from meeting Madonna. Oh wow! Oh Jesus Christ! Now, on, a, on, on that same on that same trip, like like we met Janet, and then Janet left, and then Tip called downstairs, and he was gonna take us down, take Dylan downstairs, and us being me and Dylan, Dylan downstairs to meet Madonna, Jeez. but Madonna had just left. <laughs> Damn, bro. 
Yeah, that's your know, that that's that diff type of legacy right there with Madonna and woof. She got out like crazy. But like even like with you guys now too, like I have to ask now too, because like this DVD is like one of the most iconic hip hop DVDs in my opinion now too. And the world would also agree with now too. But how important is the European tour for you? Oh man, um you know, it's uh it's it's the la- it's the last time, like as I said before, it's the last time that, you know, we got to rock with Dillo on stage and and live that life that, you know, he kind of, you know, got us in line with. You get what I'm saying? Uh, so, yeah, man, that tour is, is, is monumental and it's sad and emotional and, and all those different things. But for me, very necessary. I feel that we're lucky to have that on film. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and the, the goal wasn't to film it. You get what I'm saying? Like, me and Dank were already in Europe three weeks before that tour started. Okay. And we have been filming all of our stuff. So it's stuff from our previous three weeks cut into the European vacation. Uh, 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 Dank doing, um, uh, 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 I can't think of his name now, his, his superhero character that you've seen in the video. Yes, sir. A couple times. Yeah, like that was prior. That was prior, and then he started that before, and he continued that while we was on tour with him. <laughs> right? like, so, um, yeah, no, uh, so, and again, and actually, when we, the actual DVD that came out, we had that edit. We changed it up a little bit for the actual release. Okay. We had cut that together and was watching it at home just for our personal viewing pleasure. Oh, you know what I'm saying? It had nothing to do with putting it out. That came later to try to do some good business in the name of him. You understand? And, and to do business with his family, with his moms, and whatever. So, um, but that initially wasn't the goal. We didn't like say, "Hey, yeah, we about to film this and put it out as a DVD." That, that wasn't it. We had already been filming. And another level of the game is that we had not seen Dylan. Uh, prior to that tour, right? Oh, wow. Because we were living in Canada and he was in LA. So we had no idea he was actually in a wheelchair. Oh, wow. Like, we found out he was in a wheelchair when he we met him at the airport. Like, we got our plane to the airport and got off the plane and, and then they came in from the US and got off the plane and that's when we saw that he was in a wheelchair. You understand? Yeah. And I went to him because that's my guy, you know? And say, yo, you know, we got the cameras out. But, you know, if you don't want us to film you, bro, we won't. You understand? Yeah. And he's like, nah, Frank, film that. <laughs> film that. Nah, yeah. do it. And, you know, in hindsight, he knew what, what he had going on. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, he kept us shielded from how sick he actually was. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was more about, for us, for me, he would always get a little sick and bounce back. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Just because Dilla was the type of dude that would sit in the studio for 15 hours working, not eat, not do nothing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you have those moments. And I've done it too. It's happened to me. You know what I'm saying? So um, I never took it that serious in the sense that I took it serious that he needed to take whatever medication, but I didn't know exactly what it was. I didn't know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And he would he wouldn't tell us that. You know what I'm saying? He, he shielded us from that. So, again, that tour, filming that tour, we didn't even know he was in a wheelchair. Yeah. So again, it's a uh, a blessing. And again, he 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 said, "No, nah, Frank, film it." And again, he knew he knew better. He knew that you're gonna need this later. Yeah. You know? Man. So, yeah. No, it's a, a super monumental thing, but not on some... It's very personal why yeah. that's so monumental. You know what I'm saying? And, like, and like, even, like, what you said, like, monumental now, too. Like, um, I, I bet you, like, it just replays over and over in your head. It's like, wow, we, like, filmed something, like that's so precious to us because we have timeless memories that we can all re- go back and rethink, but to actually, like, have it on film, that's, that's something else. Yeah, yeah. No, it's again. It's it's a blessing to have it, you know. Yeah, and like and like I have to ask now too. Like 
even like being on Twitter or like that. What's Hex Murder like? No, Hex the best, man. Shout <laughs> yeah. out to Hex Murder. Shout, Shout out to, to Hex Murder. Hex, Hex is crazy, man. Hex is Hex is like the like your your crazy cuz. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like you love him to death, but he's crazy. And he might he might uh choke somebody right now. He might not though. He might not. <laughs> <laughs> but the chances is that he might choke the hell out of somebody right now, you know? Uh nah, Hex, man, that, that's my guy, man. Hex been, you know, around and and, and and the homie for for years since, you know, back in the St. Andrews days in Detroit. Yeah. And, this is a question that I ask all my guests now, too. And the reason why I ask this question now, too, because when I used to listen to interviews, I used to want to hear, like, the inspirational things, even if it was, like, 15 seconds of inspiration. That's what really hit me hard. So maybe it was a huge Frank and Dink, Yancey Boys, Joint Chiefs, or a Frank and Dink fan out there who really looks up to you and needs to hear some positive information. So with that being said, do you have any words for somebody in a dark place trying to see the light? Yeah, man, I think, um, you know, uh, I think I'm proof that there's, where there's a will, there's a way. You understand? Like, uh, doing all the different things, traveling, music, dealing with great artists, and, and I think if you listed out my resume, just read it, wrote, wrote it down. And showed it to a random person, they would probably think I was a platinum recording artist or something. You understand? Just because, you know, I've been blessed to work with greats, Grammy winners, uh, multi-platinum artists. Uh, I've been able to do and rub elbows with all of them. But not all of them, but a lot of them. And but without having that type of numbers success. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So... So for for the guy out there who feels that they want to do this or anything uh, in life, but they have their own way of doing it, they got their own way of seeing it, uh, you don't have to compromise that to achieve things. And maybe you might not get get it like someone else, but maybe it's not meant for you to get it like someone else. You got to get it like you get it. You understand? So, you know. And all these accomplishments are accomplishments. They, they, you know, in your personal life. So, you know, one might say, Frank, man, well, you ain't got no platinum record. You know, you ain't really made nothing. You ain't really done nothing in music. You know what I'm saying? There's people that say that. And for me, nah, bro, I didn't play in front of 40,000 people in a foreign country. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. I've traveled. I, I've been all over the world. Uh, all over the world, and I've never been on vacation. You understand? Wow. So, uh, yeah, man, I got I got people who can recite my raps, and you know, uh, friends and 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 things all over the world. I have all these things that is not easy to achieve. No, definitely and, not. You know, for me. That's a comp. That's an accomplishment. That's not. That's not. Uh, that's not for me to look down upon because I don't have a gigantic mansion. You understand? Yeah. Uh. Uh. But and I, I'm cool. You know, I'm cool with that. I got friends with mansions. I go visit them. It's all. <laughs> it's all good. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I ain't really tripping on that. You know what I'm saying? That's not why I do this. It's not what I'm here for. Yeah. Uh. If mansion money come. Great, we'll deal with that then. But if it don't, I'm still gonna be the same music guy I've been, and still trying to be creative and, and innovative and doing something I love to do. I can't. I I grew up with a love for music. You understand? So for me to be able to do this and have any semblance of life, to be able to travel the world and do any of that, is a blessing. So you know, for everybody again out there, man, you know. Your perception of it is the biggest thing. Mm. And once you get that in check, the rest of this is just whatever it is. You understand? Yes, sir. Well, that was, That's all. 
That was a beautiful answer, man. Like, man, I'm sorry for using the word beautiful, but man, that was, that was a very beautiful, phenomenal uh, answer, man. I appreciate you sharing such valuable jobs on the show. I appreciate that, man. Yeah, man. Um, so before I let you go, Frank, um, my co-host, sometimes firstborn, um, says peace and prosperity be with you. Yes, tell him I said peace. Okay, and then um, is there anything that you like to plug in before I let you go, Frank? Um, I'll put in all of this, all everything that we talked about in the subscription, so where they can cop some J. Dilla merch from you. Yes, sir. Log on to deliciousvinyl dot com. Get your fresh J. Dilla merch. We got a sale going on. The uh, 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 the code the, the the code is Dilla fifteen D I L L A fifteen, and you can get fifteen uh, percent off. And when you make a purchase of whatever kind, whether it be a mask like so. Or a T-shirt, or a hat, or art, whatever it is, you'll get the uh, J Delicious Mixtape Volume One uh, for free. Uh, that's one. Number two, go cop Frontal Leaf Beats Volume Two. It's out right now, on all digital platforms via Delicious Vinyl. Uh, uh, big shout out to everybody over at Delicious Vinyl, the whole fam. Um, and uh, shout out to my brother Dank Rehar. Go cop his new joint Stripe. That's out. Uh, another project, real quick. Everybody go and put your hands on T3 solo project. It's called Mr. Fantastic. Oh it's out on Delicious God, Vinyl. I and I actually, I actually did some executive work on that record. Oh, another executive Frank Net production. Okay. Yeah, that's another one that oh, I did yeah, some right. executive work on. Like, I, I brokered that deal. And, 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 and yeah. <laughs> fan business, yeah. we like to call it. Yeah, fan business, <laughs> baby. You know, I mean, you know, I don't mind doing that. Man. That's, 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 that's easy work. That's good work. Well, well, Frank, um, I, I like to, like I said, I always have a Detroit-based artist on each of my season premieres. So to have Frank and and Frank and Dank on the season premiere meant the world to me because I listened to you guys in high school. So you're welcome back on the show anytime you want to promote something. All you got to do is just send me a DM and make it happen. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. And yeah, man, uh, you know, we got some stuff coming soon, so I'm going to be sending you some things for the promotion package. <laughs> All right. Well, do, my guy. It'll be well appreciated. I'll do the same back. Okay, bro. Peace.